I think you need to write an article called uh, The Argument from Pee and Poo for the Resurrection of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be an interesting uh, article. And I hope uh, there'll be as many people reading it as um, as much as there are many people uh, watching Kologia. <laughs> All right. I see it's going to be up to me to elevate this discourse. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. In January, Dr. Andrew Loke of Hong Kong Baptist University was interviewed on whether Jesus' disciples may have seen hallucinations and briefly referenced me. I responded with a video, mostly deferring to other experts to express my disagreement. Dr. Loke and Capturing Christianity lashed back with a three-plus-hour stream about the deceptiveness of my response and a flurry of social media accusations that I was intentionally dishonest. I took time in a reply video to defend my character. Cameron changed his mind and apologized in written form and in yet another live stream. Apology, I'm very, very sorry for having said that. And uh, I'm, I'm doing everything that I can to, to try to remedy that. Followed by another 90 minutes of renewed grievances. It's important that, uh, you know, that we remind the audience that you know, there, are, there are a lot of other points right, which has, he has not addressed yet. No, not yet. But now. Apology, his whole point, I think, with his video was to sort of clear his name and to so that it, it didn't. Because uh, th that's what, you know, and I, I again, I take full responsibility for uh, basically changing the whole discussion from what it should have been about where we're talking about, you know, what, what's the truth about? That's what I want. To talk about the truth about Jesus' resurrection, what evidence we have, and is it sufficient to warrant belief. As such, as much as my ego would like me to defend myself for another round, this video is going to completely ignore the distractions of accusations and personal justifications. Let's not bicker and argue about who killed who and focus exclusively on Andrew's key points about his cumulative case for the group appearances of resurrected Jesus, as sprinkled throughout four and a half hours of live streaming. This video is going to be significantly shorter than that. So, while I promise I've done my best to put forth only the strongest version of Dr. Loke's arguments, as best as I can understand them in my non-PhD holding diminished capacity. The people without PhD you know, tend to make more mistakes compared to people with PhD. Every clip I'm going to play is, by definition, separated from the full four hours of context. So, please assume that every single clip is out of context. Pologia actually took me out of context again. Is unintentionally misrepresenting Dr. Loke in some way. I'm going to show how Pologia misrepresented me again. And would make perfect sense if only you read Dr. Loke's book instead of watching YouTube. A lot of people just listen to like uh, to Pologia and without actually reading my book, for example, right? Just as 1 Corinthians 15 invited church members to go check on claims for themselves, so too I invite you with all the links down in the description. Coincidentally, if for some reason you don't accept this invitation, you'll be supporting my case. Here we go. To remind everyone, the question at hand is, who saw risen Jesus? Andrew thinks we have good evidence for at least 515 people, where I posit that the entire body of historical evidence is completely explainable, with as few as two people claiming to have seen risen Jesus. For some reason, before addressing my hypothesis, Dr. Loke committed a genetic fallacy. Now we know that Pologia is, uh, well, Pologia doesn't have a PhD himself. By insinuating that my credentials could have some bearing on the veracity of my ideas. So I want to emphasize at, at the beginning that Pologia's own theory uh, is a fringe theory, right? It's, it's so fringe that hardly any scholar, I mean, Dr. Craig may have missed out one or two, and I may have missed out one or two, but I, I think hardly any scholar we have a PhD related to the study, you know, to, the, to this view, hold, hold this view. Further poisoning the well by brushing the hypothesis off as fringe. One has to wonder why, if my ideas are so bad, Andrew would need to take time disparaging them up front, rather than merely presenting the compelling evidence against them. Now in most fields, including science, medicine, humanities, history, and on and on, it makes sense for non-experts to allow the consensus scholarly view to be the default position, barring compelling evidence to the contrary. But, 
I would argue this is very much not the case with New Testament studies. Please allow someone with a relevant PhD to explain why. Respected New Testament expert Dr. Bart Ehrman from his debate with philosopher William Lane Craig. Bill constantly quotes modern scholars as if somehow that constitutes evidence for his point of view. As Bill himself knows, the fact that the majority of New Testament scholars would agree with his four points is not proof that they are right. For one thing, the majority of New Testament scholars are believers in the New Testament. That is, they're theologically committed to the text. So of course they agree on these points. But it's even worse than that, because the majority of New Testament scholars work for, or attend as students, institutions that require them to sign a statement of faith that affirms biblical inerrancy. That is, they've specifically signed away their ability to professionally consider that the Bible might have errors. To do so would automatically cost them their job or degree. This is not a field of academic freedom. This is a field of publicly flaunted commitment in writing to a presupposed conclusion over intellectual rigor. If the evidence is so great, why require a signed loyalty pledge? New Testament studies may be the only field in the world where being considered fringe could add credibility rather than take away credibility. Not even atheists or agnostics scholars hardly any, right? The number of credentialed atheists and agnostics whom Dr. Loke would consider to be in the field is minuscule to start with. So there's not many to draw from, even if all their views perfectly aligned with mine. But more importantly, these handful of scholars aren't actively engaged in counter-apologetics. They stick to history. Just like credentialed astrophysicists spend very little time debunking flat earth theories. I'm not talking about whether miracles can happen. I don't accept Hume's argument that miracles can't happen. I'm asking, suppose miracles do happen. Can historians demonstrate it? No, they can't demonstrate it. If Bill wants to flash up his mathematical possibilities again, then I suggest that he plug in other historical options. For example, the one that I've already laid out that he's ignored, that possibly two of Jesus' family members stole the body, and that uh, they were killed and thrown into a common tomb. It probably didn't happen, but it's more plausible than the explanation that God raised Jesus from the dead. Let me give you another explanation, just off the top of my head from last night. Atheist and agnostic New Testament scholars don't put up any single theory, because to them, any and all theories are on the table. Their studies might actually be harmed by being pinned down. Now, I've observed that Christian apologists online like to scoff and characterize this as weakness, frustrated by how convincing this folly seems to be to the flock. And since I'm famously not a scholar whose career can be unnecessarily limited by commitment to a single hypothesis, I decided to put forth a single narrative that I believe to be fully supported by all the evidence first articulated in my video, How Christianity Probably Began, No Resurrection Required. To be sure, it is a synthesis of the work of reputable scholars like Bart Ehrman, Gerd Ludemann, Candida Moss, and others, including Christian scholars. You'll find nothing wholly original to me or outside of established scholarship. I'm just the one taking charge, pressing apologists to actually find a hole in it, and am instead met with scoffing, rather than actual refutation. Now, if we're through casting dispersions, is Andrew ready to address the arguments? Okay, so let me first uh, point out some methodological problems with Pologius' view. And you know, we may call this ground rules. <laughs> On his own authority, Andrew unilaterally decrees a few things. First, that we refer to the Bible books as ancient Christian sources. I think that's because he doesn't like my jingle. He calls this the, oh, the Bible tells me so, objection, right? Uh, you know, he says that, well, you Christians only have your Bible as a source. Fine. Asking for corroboration of the claims in your ancient Christian sources isn't going to change anything, because Andrew's next ground rule is his acknowledgement that the claims can't be corroborated, no matter what you call them. Looking for outside uh, there is ancient non-Christian written sources for corroboration, and more first-hand so written sources may be difficult under certain circumstances. First, 
if Andrew is under the impression that I'm specifically insisting upon non-Christian corroboration, then that's a misunderstanding. I'm merely asking for reliable and independent corroboration, whatever the independent source might be, secular or not. To his previous point, some of the documents in the Bible are independent of others, where some are unquestionably literary dependent upon each other, like the Synoptic Gospels, and as such are not independent corroboration. Of course, this is case by case, but when a claim can't be corroborated within this framework, it's undeniably, for the Bible tells me so. Second, imagine if a prosecuting attorney showed up to court and started their opening statement with a PowerPoint presentation about why finding evidence is hard and how the judge and jury are unreasonable for asking for evidence because finding evidence is hard and asking them to convict even if the evidence is unconvincing because finding evidence is hard. Excuses aren't evidence. Relatively fewer people were writing during that time compared to today. Greco-Roman historians, their primary interest was Rome. Tacitus dismissed Christianity as a most, super, a most mischievous superstition. Jewish writers were in the main unwilling to engage polemically with Christianity in their extant writings. Non-Christian ancient authors might have thought that they could not explain away the claim of Jesus' resurrection convincingly. There could be a thousand great, factually sound, legitimate reasons for why evidence isn't available for a case. But those excuses will never turn silence into evidence. We have the hand we are dealt. If you can't convict with what you have, you can't convict. I'm sorry, but those are the breaks. An all-knowing God and university professors should be aware of this. Fair points to bring up, I guess, but this is essentially Andrew pre-acknowledging that the evidence he has will probably seem disappointing. Pologia seems to you know, keep assuming that, oh, I, I have to have you no know, first-hand source or I have to have external cooperation before I can accept something as, as true. You know, he, he's, he, he seems to uh, hold very strongly. You know, he, he thinks that this is a high standard which he, he needs to uh, hold on to. Well, I apportion my confidence in the truthfulness of a claim to the evidence available for said claim. The only purpose to consider evidence is to corroborate something. Now, corroboration can come in many forms. I'm not attempting to dictate form. Like, if you tell me you own a car... I'm aware that many adults own cars, and that awareness could be enough to affirm such a mundane claim. But if you tell me you own several Lamborghinis, I might want photos or to see the pink slips. Now you saw it. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that's not a Lamborghini. Basic corroboration is not a high standard. It's really the bare minimum standard, barely above just taking someone's word for it. If I was willing to take someone's word for it, I'd just believe the Bible without question and be a Christian and have no need for apologetics. Dr. Loke had another important point for me. See if you can catch it. What we have in the written source is only the, the tip of the iceberg. Written first-hand sources may just be the tip of the iceberg. The written first-hand sources may just be the tip of the iceberg. Written first-hand source may be the tip of the iceberg. It's only the tip of the iceberg. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Just the tip of the iceberg. Just the tip of the iceberg. Perhaps play a little game called just the tip. Just for a second. That's just the tip of the iceberg. For one more pudding, I'll tell you why he's jealous of me. According to Dr. Loke, when it comes to evidence for the resurrection appearances, the documentary evidence we have is this part above water. And the evidence that we don't have, but that might possibly have existed in some form at some time, can be represented by the rest of the iceberg below water. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I want you to consider the fact that the evidence that we actually have in this case may well represent just the tip of the iceberg. Please consider the very real possibility that somewhere, at some time, in some form we can only speculate about, there may well have been other significant evidence that I can't demonstrate in any way. If we all imagine what this evidence might have been and speculate that there's a whole lot of it, well, I think you'll find my case very compelling indeed. I'm sorry, Andrew. 
but I'm not yet on board with this argument from hypothetical evidence. But I'm listening. Please elaborate. Polo Gear replied to a number of important arguments by rejecting inference. He just replied by saying, oh, you know, that's just an inference. He just dismissed it by saying that that's an inference. To be fair, I did this only once. The fifth is that Paul cared about his reputation, and so would have done some rigorous fact-checking before passing along this creed. That's an inference. There's a difference between an inference, which is what you're making, and eyewitness testimony, which we do not have. But Christian New Testament scholar Dr. Dale Allison makes a good point. There is a tangible difference between an inference and testimony. And because not every listener is going to know the Bible with the kind of intimate detail as PhD scholars like Dr. Loke, I think it's appropriate to point out to the general audience when someone is quoting directly from the texts and when they're making inferences from the text. I find that some apologists are not very careful about identifying which claims are which, perhaps assuming their audience is as highly biblically literate as they. So, I'm providing additional factual information to help the listener come to a fully informed conclusion. I'm sure Andrew would agree with that goal. Now, I would agree with Dr. Loke that the value of any given inference will fall on a spectrum of very reasonable and supported to not at all reasonable and supported. The use of inference can be highly reliable, right? It depends on the the validity, the, the quality of the evidence of the inference, supporting the inference. Here, Dr. Loke affirms that inferences should be corroborated with evidence. Earlier, it seemed he was scolding me for wanting corroboration. I'm glad we're on the same page now. Corroboration with evidence determines the quality of the inference. I mean, there, there are different kinds of inference. You know, some inference may be good, some inference may be bad. I agree, but I go one step further. Where an inference lies on the spectrum of good and bad, if those are code words for convincing and non-convincing, can be subjective. What may seem like a reasonable inference to one may not seem reasonable or convincing to another. I personally think confidence in an inference should be apportioned to the supporting evidence. Which is why, for the remainder of this video, I'm merely going to present competing inferences and the corroborating evidence and ask you, the viewer, to make your own decisions on which inferences are good or bad or something in between. We still need to consider the writings which we do have. We do, and we shall. And only an hour after the start of the live stream. Either there were no groups of people who claimed that they saw the bodily resurrected Jesus. I mean, this was a legend. Paul was passing on a, a, a legend. Or there were such people. Right? Either, either there were no groups. So I, I'm focusing on groups here, right? Because that is the key point of contention between me and Pologia. Uh, Pologia denied that there were groups of people. So I'm arguing that at least eight considerations that provides a cumulative case um, to arrive at the conclusion that there were groups of people who had the experience. So we're going to take a look at all eight of Andrew's considerations, though I trust he'll forgive me that it will be in a slightly different order. Let's begin with number five. Paul assumed responsibility for the tradition that he passed and he, Paul cared about his reputation uh, with his audience in Corinth. And the cost of false confirmation would have been very high for Paul. So given which Paul would have been very careful to make sure that he passed on what he knew is true. This was the point that on round one, I kind of just dismissed as inference. And as much as I'd like to do a full court press and dig in to justify my conclusion of unsupported inference, for the sake of time, today I'm going to grant Dr. Loke this point as expressed in the black banner of this slide for the sake of discussion because all it really says is that Paul would have wanted to be sure he was correct. And I'm happy to grant that Paul really thought he was correct. That has no bearing on whether he was actually correct, but Paul was confident in his conclusions. No doubt. Now, the second consideration is that the resurrection of Jesus was foundational to, to the Christian faith. Now, Paul Logia accept this point, um, that, so I, I don't have to say very much about this. And I'll say even less. Moving on. Now, in tandem with these first points, it's my most charitable understanding of Dr. Loke's case that these next four points are meant to advocate for a scenario where members of the Church of Corinth would not only have heard the report of 500 witnesses, but also launched and executed a personal investigation into the matter with an affirming conclusion. 
for those unfamiliar, from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Apologists infer that the most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, is an invitation to go talk to these 500 people about whom the letter says nothing else. Okay, let's talk about the first consideration, right? So in my previous talk, I mentioned that many ancient people were highly skeptical of body resurrection. To corroborate this, Andrew's slides and his book describe groups of first century belief systems, philosophies, and noted philosophers. What he does not document is why we should expect this outside the church thinking could reliably inform us about the skepticism of the members inside the church of Corinth any more than documenting some 21st century groups, adherence to Islamic thinking, Mormon thinking, philosophical naturalism, secular humanism, Noam Chomsky and Daniel Dennett could possibly inform someone about the skepticism levels of the members of Grace Point Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky. In his book's single paragraph in this section about the actual members of the church at Corinth, Andrew interprets 1 Corinthians 15, 12 wildly different than I do, without footnoting other scholarly works for me to evaluate. Interpretation versus interpretation. See my initial video for that discussion. But fortunately for today's purposes, we don't have to get into the weeds on that, because in both his presentation and his book, Dr. Loke affirms that not everyone would have been skeptical. So we shouldn't think of people in the ancient world as very gullible. You know, um, I mean, they, they are gullible around. Um, they are gullible people around during their time. As, uh, even today, they are, they are also gullible people around, right? Um, but they are also skeptics around. I'm willing to say that some portion of the church were unskeptical while another portion of the church were either initially skeptical or had ongoing doubts. Now, keep in mind that, according to scholars like Jerome Murphy O'Connor, at the same time of Paul's letter, the size of the Church of Corinth would have been around 40 to 50 people. Some initially skeptical, some not. Now, the third point I mentioned was that the resurrection of Jesus was something that the earliest Christians were willing to die for. Now, because I have a particular distaste for the over-prevalent, under-evidenced resurrection argument from Apostle Martyrs, I derailed this aspect of Andrew's arguments with a non-sequitur in my first video, so allow me to shore it up here. Though Andrew makes general allusions to specific apostle willingness and to the dubious vague notion of general pre-Nero church persecution, Dr. Logue's strongest relevant evidence is a passage from the same chapter. And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now this follows immediately after a verse about baptizing people for the dead, which is weird. And Paul describes himself as facing death, then the others described as facing danger. But the inclusive pronouns us and we make it, in my view, a reasonable inference that the members of the Church of Corinth faced some kind of danger. The uncorroborated inference Andrew is making is that because members of the Church of Corinth endangered themselves, taking Paul's letter at face value, that those specific persons would therefore have been extra certain of the truth of Jesus' resurrection, and further inferring that this would have included personal investigation into the alleged 500 witnesses. The most obvious objection here is, of course, that because the members of the Church of Corinth weren't among the eyewitnesses, no matter how high their confidence, and no matter how rigorous their investigation, all we in 2021 can take from such a line of thinking is that they really believed it. Right. A lot of people will be willing to die for what they think is true, even though they, that may not be true. Exactly. But I would argue the willingness to die, or the threat of danger for a belief, is no guarantee that the belief is rigorously held. The obvious example... Of course, no, we know that uh, you know, there are Islamic terrorists, for example, right, who also sacrifice for their faith. At least some of whom were indoctrinated to be so rather than becoming terrorists through well-reasoned investigation. But if I may dip into my own Mennonite heritage instead, my maternal grandfather fled Russia for Canada as a child due to a constant barrage of village invasions that included arson, rape, and murder that was allowed by the government because of their Mennonite religious and pacifist beliefs. I would recommend a documentary called And When They Shall Ask, linked in the description, 
If you want the detailed depictions of the horrors that my grandfather and many in my childhood church faced, these people are beloved to me, and I was very curious about the persecution stories growing up. I would vouch with my life for their utter sincerity of their beliefs, but I also know that they were not intellectually rigorous beliefs. Literacy was not a priority to these villages. They knew the gospel from low German hymns and selected scripture readings. They couldn't tell you who Tacitus or Josephus or Clement or Origen were, let alone what role they might play in resurrection historicity, even after they relocated to safety. These were people who faced death every day, but it didn't drive them to be hungry for evidence. But Paul, you might be saying, your anecdote isn't evidence any more than Dr. Loke's inference is evidence. And I say, correct. The threat of danger might make some people more investigatively rigorous, but it can also cause people to lean more heavily into the kind of faith that Hebrews 11.1 describes as confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. These are inferences, but I know which one I've seen more often. I think the best we can say is that severe potential consequences might have led some to be inclined toward wanting verification, and some not. Now suppose you were in the fraction of the skeptical Corinthians, and in the fraction of those inclined to investigate due to danger. How could you possibly do so with the limited clue in the letter? It says, He appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time. That doesn't seem like enough evidence with which to launch an investigation. Something I pointed out with the help of Dr. Dale Allison a few videos back. My argument is about what the Corinthians could verify, whereas his argument in the clip that Pologia cited was about what we can know, right? What we can know, not, what, not about what the Corinthians can know. I wasn't talking about you know, 21st century people like us. I wasn't talking about we can verify. I'm saying that they could verify. What we don't know about does not imply that the Corinthians didn't know about. Remember, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Ah, uh, yes. So Dr. Loke is tacitly acknowledging my point that the vague reference to the 500 that we have in the verifiable extant documentation would not be enough information to investigate the claims, be it in the 1st or 21st century. The Christians in Corinth or anywhere else, they would not have believed based on the scanty information in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 8 alone. Therefore, Loke speculates that this vague reference points to a rich, detailed account in events or traditions we no longer have access to. This um, passage in 1 Corinthians 15 must have been a summary of traditional resurrection narratives which were told in fuller forms elsewhere. A form of Damok and Jalad at Tanagra, as it were. Note that Loke uses must have been a summary, not might have been a summary. Why must it be? because otherwise they wouldn't have had enough information to verify the 500. But, since their ability to verify the 500 is the claim we're investigating, then Loke is engaged in circular logic, begging the question and assuming the conclusion. Or is there further corroboration for Andrew's speculative, more information? When Capturing Christianity reached out to Dr. Dale Allison on the matter of my video editing, his reply only further reinforced my point. So here's the remaining emails between the two of us. So again, you can just pause the video if you wanted to, to read these yourself. I'm not going to read them out loud in the stream. I wish he had, but understand why they did not. Allison writes, As for the Corinthians, they may well have known more than we do. That's not implausible. Wow, that's not implausible. Bringing endorsement. Still, this is a presumption, and we have no evidence. So again, our desire for more knowledge is frustrated. I think we sadly remain here in the realm of possibility and speculation. To be clear, as a Christian, Allison thinks the 500 existed. As a historian, he doesn't deny Loke's hypothesis, calling it not implausible. In fact, I too would deign to call it not implausible. But cause sympathetic Allison does take care to emphasize that this proposal by Andrew is mere presumption, possibility, and speculation. That it's not the same as evidence-corroborated inference. In that email exchange with Capturing Christianity, 
Dr. Allison also wrote, If the Corinthians knew any of these people, why didn't Paul write? Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, including your friends Faustinus and Vitus, although some have died, or some such. I just thought that was funny. Moving on. The fourth point is that I mentioned that people could check out whether they were eyewitnesses or not. Or not. I suppose I'd agree that it's possible that Corinth church members could have attempted to verify these claims. If that's where you leave it, this is essentially an argument that Paul was incapable of bluffing, or that Paul was incapable of passing on sincere but mistaken information. Given that Andrew has gone through so much trouble to posit that some might have been skeptical, and some of those might have been prompted by danger, and some of those might have somehow obtained information not found in the letter, I presume he's arguing that some of the subset of the subset of the subset actually did it, actually launched a personal investigation into the 500 witnesses. This is a basic uh, fact that, uh, about uh, human nature, which uh, the disciples uh, wouldn't have just uh, believed based on the scanty information that is written alone. I see. Dr. Loke is now appealing to the broad category of human nature. By his psychoanalysis, everyone takes time to critically examine additional information when it is available to them. It's just human nature, like we observe today. Right, Andrew? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised at how many people, uh, I mean, I, I look at some of the comments in YouTube, I'm, I'm surprised at how many people you know, actually say, oh, Pologia, you did a good job, you know, uh, Pologia, you have debunked Andrew Loke, you know, but you know, I, I'm surprised at how many people actually don't read my book, you know, they... You know, uh, they, they just believe what Pologia says, and, you know, they are, they are misled by, by Pologia. Uh-oh. Is it human nature to check claims or to not check claims? If it's the former, why didn't everyone in my audience go out and download your free book? I mean, a lot of people nowadays, they just listen, listen, but they don't read. You know, they don't actually f check out the facts. Well, now Andrew has made two competing inferences about human nature. I guess I'll let you check out the evidence for yourself, or not, as all humans do. It's not listed in any of his points, but Andrew has another unspoken assertion, slash assumption, slash inference, that the subset of a subset of a subset of a subset of people who accepted the invitation to undertake an investigation of the 500 were successful in their mission to find them. Of course, we have no sources of any kind reporting such a success, inside or outside of the church, so we are further and further down the speculation line. But an apologist like Andrew might protest that anyone whose investigation of the 500 came up wanting would leave the church and stop believing. And I say yes, I agree. Who is to say that exactly that didn't happen? If the church at Corinth was around 50 people at the time, if we split these competing and compounding inferences at each step, we're left with maybe three people who've gotten this far to be actively investigating. Even if it's 10 or 20, would the early church do some kind of exit interview and record the failed interviews and then keep copying this record of shame for generations? No, not at all. And even if I'm generous to Andrew and say that among the handful who might have investigated, that some found personally satisfactory confirmation, and some did not, that tells us nothing about which group used better methods and a more rigorous epistemology. Now, there's no proof of that. Right? This is a total speculation from Spelogia. There's no proof that those unbelievers actually use a more rigorous standard. That's exactly right, Andrew. There's no proof of any of this. Absence of evidence is not... Uh, always equal to the, the you know, uh, absence, right? So um, it, it could be that they may, it could be that there may be others, but we lack the evidence to show it. We're so deep into hypothetical speculation land, I'm not sure either of us can see back to the actual evidence anymore. And it gets at least one more assertion worse for Dr. Loke, because even if some of the tiny church launch a full investigation and find a few witnesses, how can we in any way be confident that the witnesses found were not lying or simply mistaken? 
In a previous video, I played some clips from Dr. Elizabeth Loftus on false memories and other studies where people began to believe they were involved in events they hear about. I won't repeat those again, but there are so many ways that a person can be both sincere and mistaken. That this happened in the early church is, by my view, a very reasonable inference. I don't see on what grounds Andrew could insist that no one was mistaken. Or perhaps that there were nefarious people around who were willingly lying about being one of the 500. So people can be telling stories, make up stories about, oh, you know, these saints did wonderful things, you know, and then use this you know, to attract people to come and visit, you know, to, to make money from it, right? Uh, to, to give donations to the churches and to make money. Well, I think that it could be fraud. You know, I mean, th there could be stories like this um, that uh, Buddhists were, were making up, right, to, to, to get money. I mean, this is a possibility that needs to be considered and to be ruled out. If that needs to be considered and ruled out in one case, it needs to be considered and ruled out in another. Huh. That's a lot of words on a few verses in 1 Corinthians 15. We not only have 1 Corinthians 15, but we also have um, first and century, early second century documents. Cool. But this video is already longer than I wanted, so we're going to try to deal with these as briefly as Andrew does. Such as the four Gospels, Acts. Okay, very briefly. While the Gospels can reasonably be considered independent of 1 Corinthians, it's difficult to imagine the Gospel writers were unaware of a 40-year-old creed considered central to the Christian faith. However, the Gospels cannot be considered independent of each other, in the 90-ish percent of Mark is copied directly into Matthew and into Luke, and more and more New Testament scholars are acknowledging that John was aware of Mark, if not using it directly as reference. That said, when it comes to corroboration value for group appearances, it gets even worse. With the original ending, Mark contains no post-resurrection appearances of any kind, so scratch it. And of the appearances described in Matthew, John, and Luke Acts, none of these sources manage to corroborate even a single story among them. Each appearance is from one source, and one source only. No corroboration. So Dr. Loke, Dr. Lycona, and others like to point instead to a motif, as if similar themes might be enough for corroboration. I look at why historians reject motif as corroboration in a previous video. Other letters written by um, Paul writing to uh, churches in various places. None of the other six undisputed letters of Paul speak about group appearances of resurrected Jesus. In fact, none of the disputed pseudepigraphical letters do either. I'm not sure why this is on the list. First Clement. The closest thing First Clement has to group appearance affirmation is this. Having been fully assured through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and confirmed in the word of God with full assurance of the Holy Ghost. That's not a group appearance claim. And whatever it is, is secondhand from scripture and the Holy Ghost. Because of Ignatius. Written decades after the Gospels, in his epistle to the Smyrnians, Ignatius recounts the resurrection appearance story from John 20. Referencing a work doesn't corroborate it. Etc. I don't know how to respond to etc. And finally, the last point. It couldn't have been just a kind of bereavement experience. Right? It must have been something solid, uh, which they experienced as a group together, right? In order that they could be convinced in the first place. Andrew has shifted to phrases like couldn't have been and must have been, where might have been or adequately explains would have been more appropriate. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. He's no longer admitting that he's making inferences. He's stating his conclusion as fact but he is still in the realm of inference. Again, I'll infer the opposite, that because we observe many people throughout history believing things without significant evidential affirmation, even things that were important to them and that put them in danger, that it's entirely possible that early Christians could have believed without significant evidential affirmation. Andrew's decree is merely special pleading. There must have been some solid evidence Right, uh, uh, which you know, such as what you find in the Gospels. First, the Gospels weren't available to the first generation of Christians. Second, if I considered the Gospels to be solid evidence, then I'd still be a Christian. What we're looking for is evidence to corroborate the claims found in the Gospels. Much like in a court, 
you want physical evidence to corroborate the stories of your witnesses. Though with the Gospels, we don't have sufficient warrant to even treat them as witnesses. That, you know, I, you know I, I, Alison just says, no, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But just citing his assertion that I don't know doesn't answer my argument, right? It doesn't answer my argument that solid evidence would have been required in the first place. I don't know isn't an assertion of fact or about reality. It is an assertion of an individual state of knowledge. It's generally the honest answer to any given question. Solid evidence would have been required is an assertion and one that fundamentally misunderstands psychology and human nature. I'm confident that you can think of a time when you, or someone you know, believe something without solid evidence, defeating Loke's absolute assertion from the start. Early Christians may have had solid evidence, or maybe they didn't, or maybe they thought they had solid evidence, but were mistaken. This is the honest, I don't know answer from someone who isn't ideologically starting from a predetermined conclusion. Since we have no direct access to the past, all ancient history is known to varying degrees through inference. Right? That's the point that uh, I was trying to make. So what, what is an inference? An inference is a, co is a conclusion reached on the basis of evidence. That's right. When it comes to whether there were group appearances of resurrected Jesus, we're looking for conclusions based on evidence. Not on assertions, not on speculation, not on a footnote citing the agreement of men whose employment requires signing a statement that he will agree. So little actual evidence was presented that I'm not sure Andrew and I even disagree about much of it. Andrew's arguments live almost entirely below the surface of what we have evidence for, underneath the tip of the iceberg, as he himself admits. What remains is for you the viewer, to evaluate whether the assertions, inferences, and speculation of Dr. Loke are more reasonable than the assertions, inferences, and speculation that I have replied with. Now before we go... The tradition of Festivus begins with the airing of grievances. I got a lot of problems with you people. Now you're going to hear about it. And so I, I pointed out um, 15 ob ob uh, ob objections right in my three hour video. And moreover, two more objections have been added, right, with his latest video. And so now Pologia has 17 points, right, to respond to. Okay. Now, and I think this will be a test of Pologia's intellectual honesty. He put his finger right on my problem. My lack of integrity. Oh. Well, I'd hate to fail a test of intellectual honesty. But as these are side trails, not central to the resurrection discussion, I'm not willing to waste your time responding on video. For anyone who cares, I'll put brief written responses to Andrew's grievances in the description of this video. And speaking of the video description, remember that I may have used clips out of context. I may have misunderstood or misrepresented arguments, and I may have misled you in some way. But since I want to be better than 1 Corinthians, I'm giving all the direct links that you need to verify my words for yourself in said video description. Do we want to check out whether what Paul says is true or not? If anyone was really hoping for a presentation taking three or four hours, never fear. If you tap on the Apologia vs. Resurrection playlist thumbnail on screen now, you'll have a good start. Huge thanks to everyone who expressed support of me during this exchange. It means more than you know. Until next time, later.